New developments with the ship's static fire stand at Massey's, maintenance stand iterations at Sanchez, framing of the office building continues at the build site and wick work is finalised for orbital pad B at the launch site. Hey everyone, my name's Jeff Fay and welcome to RGV Aerial Photography's Starbase Flyover Update Episode 38. We'll be covering updates at SpaceX's Starbase Texas facilities, cruising at an altitude of 10,500 feet. Fasten your seatbelts and enjoy the flight. We'll start here at Massey's and later make our way east to the rest of what Elon Musk likes to call the Gateway to Mars. Before we dive in, let's take a quick look at a labelled map by Procky to get you orientated. Starting as always at the Flame Trench area, we can see that excavation work is still ongoing. Moving to the top right corner of the site, we see more steel that is presumed to be Flame Trench related. Panning down to the bottom of the trench, we can see the sloped concrete that was formed in the last episode has been poured and grading work has begun on the shallow ramp. Taking a quick look at the suspected QD frame spotted last week, we can see a platform has been installed on top similar to suborbital pad B at the launch site. Moving to the methane part of the tank farm, we can see the plumbing has been installed going in the direction of the lock site of the tank farm. To the right slightly, we can see the flame trench cover has been moved next to the lock subcoolers. Shifting to the flame bucket construction area, we can see the middle part of the bucket has arrived, confirming that this is indeed a three-piece bucket. Fabrication work is still ongoing on the support pieces of the bucket. We also see a series of walkways and ladders being attached to the side of two of the flame trench stringers. These parts were seen last week in smaller assemblies nearby. Moving right to the static fire stand, we can see the large steel beam spotted last week as well as a second one, have been installed between the legs on what is believed to be the front and back sides. If we look at the render by Chrome Kiwi shown last week, it is possible that these steel struts could be used for SPMTs to be able to pick up the ship and test stand for transport to and from masses, eliminating the need for a large crane. Taking a quick look at the mystery ring, we can see more pieces have been added nearly completing the circle. Moving to the structural test pad, we can see significant progress. Two legs seen in last week's flyover and an additional one have been stood up with cross beams installed. This is speculated to be an upgraded structure akin to the can crusher. Taking a closer look, you can see a curved section is suspended from a crane and being welded in this image. Moving over to Sanchez, let's first have a quick look at the labelled map from Procky. Let's begin our tour of Sanchez at the ground fabrication building. In front of the building, we can see more high pressure pipe assemblies staged. To the side of the building, the hydraulic actuator is still being worked on. Looking over to the ring assembly area, we can see minimal visible progress on the newest booster transport stand. Next to them, we see some new and used items to explore. The lift platforms for shipwork stands 1 and 3 have been partially disassembled. Tucked tightly next to them is continued work on the second booster cap ring. Moving to the tower construction area, we can see that not much progress has been made on sections 8 and 9 since the last flyover. Over at the scrapyard, we can see empty dumpsters have arrived with the full ones being taken away. The commodities farm looks largely the same with the removal of some pipework to the right of the tank above the high pressure gas tanks, as well as the large horizontal tank receiving a fresh coat of paint. Over at the rocket garden, not much activity has occurred, only a two point lifter and stand being staged here following the placement of S30 in Mega Bay 2. Finally, we visit the site of the parking garage where concrete pile cap footings have been poured and the excavation of structural piles continue as crews work to prepare the structure's foundations. Next, we move to the build site. Let's first take a look at the labelled map from Procky. Starting off from Mega Bay 2, we can see the concrete pits of the workstations on the left. Little seems to have been done with these since last week. Scaffolding has been assembled in front of the elevator shaft. Unseen is S30, now resting on the centre workstation, with work to prepare for Raptor install taking place. As seen in this clip from Lab Padre, we can see crews place S30 on the stand. Looking over to Mega Bay 1, through the door we can see B14's methane tank. The final ring section seen last week has now been stacked, leaving only the assembly of the two tanks to complete stacking of another booster. B12 and B13 remain on their work stands, with the back right stand currently vacant. With the departure of S30 from the high bay, S31 has been moved from the turntable to a transport stand in the back right. S29 returned to the tile workstation after taking a break to allow S30 to exit. 
At the nose, we can see the tip is already missing tiles as the glued tiles in this area were removed, with some already replaced. While initial tile damage following its static fires was promising, it was observed that many tiles, largely from other glued locations, were removed similar to the tip of the nose cone. As we look across to the Star Factory building, crews continue to fill in the site with structural steel. If we take a closer look toward the end of the nose cone hall, we can see the final shape this week, with the wall facing Mega Bay 2 featuring a large doorway, likely for larger ship segments to exit. Along the back of the facility, the conduits seen last week are partly covered up. We will continue to keep an eye on this area to see what it will be. Moving over to the office building, steel workers continue to make progress on its structural frame. We see in the centre section that crews have begun to spread out the corrugated sheeting that will be covered in concrete to finish the floor assemblies. Along the left wing of the building, we see triangular voids in the floor beams, suggesting that there may be an atrium in this location. This should become more apparent once the floor sheeting is in place. On the right side of the building, it appears all the structural footings have been completed, with some exterior wall form work in place as they near the completion of initial groundwork. Just across the dirt drive, in the newest ring yard, we see two payload bay pathfinders staged. Several items seen on these may hint to future changes to the ship payload bay, including a door with a new location and shape. Other cutouts indicate that the access hatch may be relocated. Nearby, we see the outer segment for an unknown dome. A look over to the village, the concrete poured recently now sports painted lines for parking spaces confirming the use of this area. Around the clinic on the right, we see more concrete has been poured, it seems this area is coming close to completion. Finally, at the payload processing facility, not much has changed, though the 6-axle SPMT and two power packs look suspiciously clean. Perhaps SpaceX has expanded its fleet. With that, let's continue to the launch site. Let's get started by taking a quick look at Procky's map as a reminder to those who may be unfamiliar with the layout. Changes at the launch site are few and far between this week, at least from our vantage point, but there was some excitement nonetheless. At the site of the next orbital launch pad, it appears the installation of the prefabricated vertical drain wicks has finally come to an end. Both machines are having their booms dismantled, marking the end of this important first step. It's currently unknown what the wait period will be before drilling of piles for the next tower or OLM begins. As for the narrow strip of wetland between the two areas that have drain wicks, we're still waiting to hear the result of SpaceX's procurement request. The public comment period for the request has ended, so hopefully some news will be released soon. Moving on to the tank farm expansion area, work to incorporate the new horizontal tanks continues. Reportedly, some venting was even noticed from the first tank for the first time on Friday evening, April 5th, which is suspected to be for liquid nitrogen storage. We now see pipework for the fourth tank nearing the level of completion as the first three. As for the other five tanks, suspected to be for liquid oxygen storage, installation work is quite a bit further behind. Following our flyover early Friday morning, crews began erecting the three large vaporizers currently on site. They have been placed on the embeds that were previously spotted on the small pad next to the two vertical white tanks near the main entrance. Moving around to the rear of the tank farm, it looks like some concrete work still remains to be done near the berm to protect the pipework that protrudes around the corner just below ground. Now we arrive at the star of today's launch site coverage. SpaceX wasted no time getting B-11 onto the OLM following Flight 3, with just over three weeks passing this time between Flight 3 and rollout. Our flyover took place just hours before closure off the pad and road, on April 5th. The tank farm finally came to life and the OLM began to vent about mid-afternoon. Prop load began just before 4pm starbase time and within no time B-11 had a full LOX tank and partially loaded methane tank. At approximately 4.30pm, the detonation suppression system activated, followed shortly after by the flame deflector plate. At last, B-11 roared into life and completed a static fire lasting somewhere between 5 and 10 seconds. This epic footage, captured by our own cameras in the dunes, shows the violent nature of the shockwave and smoke-filled plume as it interacts with surroundings. In this zoomed-in view, watch how the recently constructed blast wall diverts the plume. Minor debris can be seen ejected from the plume. If you're wondering whether the test was a success or not, the temporary road closure posted within an hour of the test concluding is a solid indication of a success. Rollback of B11 to Mega B1 to configure it for flight was already on tap. 
While SpaceX didn't confirm or deny the success of the firing, they posted incredible drone footage of the event later that evening to X stating, static fire of the Flight 4 Super Heavy booster, followed shortly after by some stunning still images. The OLM maintenance platform was moved back into position and raised on Saturday, likely to inspect the vehicle for potential damage and reinstall the engine covers to prepare for rollback. Scaffolding was erected once again later that evening. Just after lunch on Sunday, B-11 was removed from the OLM and placed on a transport stand ahead of rollback later in the day. The booster entered Highway 4 on its way back to the build site around 10.30pm Starbase time. Before we close out today's video, we have some big news on the future Starship development front after an unexpected Starship presentation hosted by Elon was dropped by SpaceX Saturday afternoon on X. In the presentation, he discussed the near-term goals for Starship, implementation of Raptor 3, along with the expectations for version 2 and 3 of Starship. Highlights of near-term goals include the potential for a booster catch, which could happen as soon as Flight 5, assuming all goes exceedingly well with Flight 4. Otherwise, this will likely push to later in the year. Ships are not expected to return to the launch site until at least two successful splashdowns have occurred. He mentioned the use of a virtual tower as a target for landing the ship in the ocean. By the end of next year, hopes are to have two launch towers in both Boca Chica and Florida, with at least one of the Florida towers, presumably 39A, coming online mid-2025. A ship-to-ship -ship prop transfer demo is also currently on tap for 2025. As for Raptor 3, let's just say it looks like it will be even more powerful than we thought. The thrust will increase to 280 metric tons for sea level engines, with vacuum engines capable of 306 metric tons. Perhaps the biggest point of emphasis for this iteration of Raptor is the ability to function without a thermal shield. While the engine has been simplified, the complexity added in to assist with cooling creates another challenge. He says it will be easy to integrate, but difficult to build. Version 2 of Starship will feature the addition of one ring to the upper stage, while the booster will just be one metre taller. Revised forward flaps, relocation of the grid fins, a new interstage and a payload mass to orbit surpassing 100 tonnes are all included in the changes. With the planned Raptor changes, booster thrust will increase from 7,130 metric tonnes to 8,240. Meanwhile, the upper stage will add an additional 350 metric tons of thrust, going from 1,250 to 1,600. Ships will retain the six-engine configuration as seen on the current version. The height increase for both vehicles includes an extension of the propellant tanks. As for version 3 of Starship, let's just say it's controversial for fans in the spaceflight community. The Starship upper stage could reach heights as tall as 70 metres, while boosters could approach 80 metres. One render showing that was really interesting was this one featuring offshore platforms with the version 3 full stack, signifying that the potential for Starship launch operations offshore are still very much a possibility. And that's it for this week's Flyover Update. Thank you so much for flying with us and we hope you enjoyed the ride. Please consider subscribing so you don't miss out on the new videos each week and leave a thumbs up on the way out. Also, please consider supporting our flyovers through Patreon to gain access to our flyover gallery the same day it occurs. Finally, join our Discord server to discuss space in general and with other like-minded people around the world. The link is in the description below. See you next week from 10,500 feet.